All right, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, welcome to Revit RVA, uh, our August edition of our music group meeting. We're glad to have you all here tonight. I'm doing my best impression of Britney Spears as I can with a microphone. Uh, this is required because, if, in case you all don't know, we're broadcasting to the planet Earth from uh, Richmond, Virginia. So uh, this is uh, Donnie's recording all this. So if you see something you like in the meeting tonight that you want to reference with somebody else, please uh, go to our YouTube and type Revit RVA. You should be able to find this. Uh, it'll be posted by uh, tomorrow or the next day. Um, <coughs> and we're broadcasting this live. So if you know of anybody that uh, is interested in these meetings that can't make it, please let them know that this is uh, another way they can uh, uh, view these get together. So, <coughs> so welcome to Revit RVA. Th this is all about you all. Um, you, uh, CAD Microsystems sponsors this group, and we sponsor uh, four, three other user groups um, in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, we do one in D.C., one in Baltimore, and also one in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And, and really the whole idea is to get people together that have similar interests, that are, you know, want to further their, their knowledge and further themselves in their career with what's going on in the modeling world. Because it's, as you know, it's... Uh, a uh, very, very dynamic uh, uh, world right now, and it's changing a lot, and there's a lot of uh, advances to be made, but it's really up to each and every one of you in this room, as well as people like you in other cities, that, and there are people like you in other cities uh, that, that, that uh, are very interested in this and take their time out to, to come out during the evening to listen to talks about and to talk to other people that are interested in, in what's going on in the modeling world. So uh, you all are, are the community. You all are what makes this up, and... Uh, CAD Microsystems is proud to support this uh, this group, and, and I want to announce tonight that we're going to be also starting one in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's going to be uh, called uh, Revit uh, Queen City, actually. It's going to be starting on October 16th. will be our first meeting down there. So we'll now have five user groups in five cities, 30 meetings a year if you do the math. Um, we typically do two or three presentations. So that's roughly about 90, uh, 60 to 90 presentations a year that we'll be recording, that we'll be doing in these each one of these cities, and sharing the presenters and sharing the ideas. Um, and, and really, this is all about you, know, you all connecting and finding other people that can help you move forward with you know, what you want to do in your career and, and with this technology. So the idea here really is to share ideas, methods, and practices, as well as to meet other people. Because how do you meet somebody that's doing kind of what you're doing that's not in your office? You know, there's uh, typically one or two of you in your offices that are really, you know, in charge of supporting in this modeling environment. So how do you meet these people? This is how you do it. And if you want to come to these any of these other cities, if there's other people there that uh, are like mine have offices in those cities, please let them know about uh, these, uh, these user groups. Uh, they are guided by Board of Advisors. Each one of these cities has a Board of Advisors like Richmond does. And what we do is the Board of Advisors gets together a week after each one of these meetings, and over lunch, we sit down and we go over this. We go over the survey. And this survey is, is really comes from each one of you uh, as to what you want to see, what's relevant, what you'd like to have in each one of these meetings. And then we decide and uh, try and go find speakers. And it's and th what's really best is when we have like we have tonight we have Lee Hammerback who's going to be presenting who uh, is from Mason Hanger and he volunteered put his hand up and said I got two or three ideas and and I want to present them and uh, it's that that is really the uh, you know what 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 he's doing that he could share with you all and and hopefully you know get the conversation moving about what you are doing that you could share with him. That's really what this is all about. So and it's, it's really good when we have local presenters, but if we don't have local presenters, we get people from, from out of the area, from other, other, u other user groups to come in and uh, um, uh, pr present for you. But please fill out the survey. Take that two minutes. There's stuff on the tables here. If you hi have an idea while we're, you know, what you'd like to see or a presentation you'd like to, please write that down because uh, that is, is really a lifeblood of how this becomes uh, relevant and, uh, um, you, know, and um, you know, useful for you all. <coughs> So tonight's agenda is, uh, I haven't presented in a while, and uh, you're going to see a presentation by the Graphically Challenged tonight. Uh, I, uh, I enjoy this. I'm a really good uh, spectator at what's going on in the modeling world. And uh, so I went to the BUILT conferences here, so I'm going to give you a little recap and tell you about what that is. And then we're going to hear from Lee Hammerback, who's going to talk about uh, fu future, pr future proofing your, uh, <laughs> or, uh, resist your, your library and ha really how to deal with that over, over the long term. It's everybody has content that they have to deal with. So, um, so anyway, let me get on with um, my, my part of the presentation. So BUILT, how many of you all in here know what BUILT is? Okay. 
So the vast majority of you probably don't understand what built is. So let me explain to you what built is and why you should really care about this. Built is a is a really it's a collection of a bunch of different um, kind of meetings and organizations, right? But really, what this is about is, is that the built is a flagship conference that was really um, developed to help people. They're doing what we're doing, right? Share all this information on a worldwide basis, right? So built really started a long time ago. It's it stands for built. What do you, do you know? Does anybody know what built stands for? Jason, I don't even know what it stands for these days. It's, it's, it's another acronym. Building Intelligence. Huh? Yeah, it's, it's something I can't really, I don't even know what it's called, called now. But, but they used to be called this. They used to be called the Revit Technology Conference. And the Revit Technology Conference is what you think it is. It's a Revit Technology Conference, right? And then all the dust police came in and said, no, you can't use the name Revit. So they changed their name to Built. For whatever reason, it's still... 90% about Revit, but it's about a lot of other things that have to do with Revit Enscape and all the other tools that you'd use with your models. But really what Revit Technology, uh, Confer Technology Conference started, I think, in 2011. And then over the years, they started holding conferences all over the world. So you see this list of cities that you see here. These are the places where they hold built conference, data days, data conferences. So look at these cities. This is all over the planet, right? So what they've done, these crazy Australians, and these people are from Australia, and uh, they are crazy if you meet them. But what they do is they've gone around the world, and they've put together conferences in local cities that um, – really bring together people that are uh, interested in the built environment. So they changed their name from Revit Technology Conference to the Design Built en en Environment Institute, right? So what this is about is this is about getting, the it's, it's about, the excuse me, the Digital Built Environment Institute. So what this is about is the, the whole umbrella, the Digital Built Environment Institute, is really how do you take this digital information that everybody's offer authoring that you're going to build from, and use it better, faster, stronger. And it's mostly around Revit, right? So they, tr they th so the DBEI is really the umbrella group, and these guys really are trying to get together like-minded, you know, thought leaders uh, uh, around the world to share their advances and their troubles, you know, so that, th so that we can design using digital information better, faster, stronger. So what they've done is the DBEI has has split and you can go look this up on the internet there's information up on it obviously but but built is their tr is their flagship conference and this conference is really the one that they get uh, it's it's kind of a it's it's expensive right but it's it's a very selective group of people so so normally it's less than 500 people that have go to this conference from around the United States right and e and each one when they do it in Asia it's still about 3 or 400 people so it's not this massive massive conference this year they broke a record and they had 560 people there but it's it's an expensive conference but it's really really focused around all the smart kids that are using these digital built in, in environments and and uh, really using Revit and pushing the technology forward and then they they have a hackathon too as well that they ha held this year uh, actually one of our uh, advisory board members won the hackathon Tim and Hazel he was the the winner of the uh, of the United States uh, DBEI hackathon, and uh, so we're very proud of that. Then they had uh, DTS, which is the Data Sharing Day and Data Day, and then the Building Content Summit, which I'll go into in, 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 in just a second. So these are all built as the uh, overall conference, and then they have these separate get-togethers based upon the in indiv individual interests. So DBEI, what's this for? It's really get the community people together, like I just talked about earlier. And then here are all the little conferences they have. So the first one is the Design Technology Summit. And this is really for a limit of 40 registrants. So what they want is they want all the large firms that are really flexing all their uh, muscle with this digital information and to get together and say, hey, what are the problems large firms are having? Because the smaller firms are going to have these shortly, right? So th this has been going on for a few years. Then they have Day to Day. And Day to Day is really about getting people together that are um, – are using data and and how they're using it could be a storage issue could be a a you know a standards issue so let's talk about that specific data and how you're going to really use these tools to to modify that data that's one day that they have kind of next to the built conference and then they have the building content summit and the building content content summit is really meant to draw people that are not really users of this technology 
but people that are building content. So if you're building light content, if you're, uh, you know, light lights in the ceilings, or if you're building, you know, structural content or duct work, you might want to go to the Building Content Summit because this is on a worldwide basis where they get together and say, how can we standardize and use the content that's being de developed better? So anyway, this is uh, the, the Built Commerce Annual Event. And uh, so they, we sponsor, I said, what are we on now? Five user groups, and we had nine people present at the conferences. So some of these presentations, you'll see it at, at our user group meetings. But here are the people that, that presented at uh, the Built Conference uh, this year. So one of the things I signed up for was to do a kind of takeaway. And I went to, a, I was just telling J Jason uh, that I went to a bunch of different sessions while I was at Built. And all of them are very interesting. Uh, these are, uh, I mean, uh, really people that are pushing the envelope with this technology. But this technology really stood out to me. So I'm only going to talk about two things as a takeaway because I could talk about 15. The conference is great. You meet a lot of great people. It was in Seattle, all that other sort of stuff. Um, but when, when I walk away from that conference and I say, you know, what did I walk away with that I didn't know anything about to before I walked into the conference, it was these guys. And these guys are tef TestFit.io. So let me tell you a little bit about this organization. TestFit.io is, is really, it's an organization that allows you, well, what they've done is they've, this is the first Forge app, and we've talked about Forge in here, but this is the first Forge app that I've seen that is mature, that is, could be used today, that has real honest to goodness value um, you know, for the long term. This is, and what they're doing is this, is they built a Forge app where if you're a developer and you have a five acre plot and you're like, hey, how many parking spaces can I put on that plot with a 240 unit um, multifamily residential uh, complex? And it gives you all the options to say, hey, uh, let me stretch and contort it this way so I can uh, quantize and say how much core space do I do I have here? How much you know usable space is going to be uh, on the on the third floor? So it has all these rules about when you're de um, um, developing these uh, these sites, and it gives you that feedback instantly, right away. Go ahead. You got it. So this is kind of an a a animation of, of what's going on. This is a GIF of kind of what it does. So you stretch and contort it. So if that, that yellow line, the orange line, the site's there, you see the building, you could put the constraints there and say, I want a three-story building or a four-story building and to have this many units, if I s uh, right? If I stretch and contort it this way, what's going to happen to the building? And you get d different um, building uh, uh, options. So... Um so it, 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 what it does is allow you to quantize that stuff very early on the project to say, hey, this is a go or no go for me and my organization. So it's really built for developers. Um, and and, and I, I, was, I was watching the presentation. I said, well, wh who, you know, what about the architect? I said, are, are they, you know, uh, using this? He says, well, in, s in some cases they are, and they're not telling the developers they're using this because they're coming up with it. It gives you many different options. But let me let me just show you a short video here. And I love the the uh, the the voice over this guy did. Uh, he must have spent uh, a tremendous amount of time on this. Here we go. In a world where drawing site plans takes forever, on sites that will never turn into real real estate development opportunities, there is a software that come to the rescue. Kill deals using test fit. Easily swap building types. Generate more schemes than the human mind can even think of. Dive head first into urban planning. Hot swap different unit styles. Tap into the power of customization. Move generated stairs, units, and elevators into custom locations. Not a fan of generative design? 
customize your building massing. We'll count the parking stalls for you. And before you ask, you can export all the data that you want. SketchUp, Revit, AutoCAD, Excel! Is that every feature we have? Nah. What about shadows? Yeah, shadows. shadows. It does shadows too, if you didn't, didn't get that. Okay. So, so. In a world. So, so I think this was really, we're, we're, I, I think this was really compelling because of uh, uh, obviously uh, it's generative design, but generative design and and machine learning and artificial intelligence are all real great buzzwords. But what does it really mean in the real world, right? And his, here's generative design, artificial intelligence, and machine learning all together, right? In in, in one program. So um, if you're looking for a good example, this is th this was a great example of of where the future is going to be going. I, I think. Um, second one was Turner Construction did a, a presentation um, <coughs> on really how they were using virtual reality and free inspections. So what they were doing is, and we've all seen this virtual reality walkthrough, you know, do, does the duct work match where it's going to be put up when it, right, all that sort of stuff. And, and that's great. But they, what they were trying to, to, to do was to say, hey, let's bring the mechanical inspector in here. Let's bring the electrical inspector in. Let's bring these guys in a lot earlier before we ever, this, and this was, by the way, this is a design build project they're working on. But let's bring these guys in really early and see if they'll do some of the free inspections on the digital model before we actually build it in the real world. So what they did was they started out with, they, they created a model and, and they took it to the guys in the field. And they actually sat down with the folks in the field and they walked through it and they, and they kind of iterated. And they said, hey, is this really valuable? And they got to the point where, they, where they, there was so much detail in the model that what they ended up doing was they dumbified the model. They took the model and they said, hey, what does this particular electrical inspector want to see? The fire, fire guy wants to see all this stuff, right? So why don't we just put huge icons of where all of it's located and give it, get the thumbs up that we have the right amount, right? So they, they shortened the project by about 30% uh, timeline because they went through the pre-inspection process. Now they had a willing inspecting organization that wanted to do this, but it was a really unique way of how they had taken virtual reality and used it to, you know, to make a project, um, you know, happen quicker. So anyway, um, that's pretty much what I got for the built recap. Uh, uh, Lee, you want to come up and get get plug in here. Um, so, uh, it's, uh, anybody that's that's interested in in um, really connecting with the the folks at Build, I've talked to them about you know how do we get these user groups are connected with because there's a tremendous amount of collective knowledge between all the people. But how do we connect all the people? And and, may, and we've talked about having chapters and what have you. But but for right now, um, you know, we're just sharing stuff in, in, in between the user groups and in, in um, the people that we have. But any questions on built or any of the things that I just talked about? Who, Devlin? Oh, sorry, Billy. I didn't see you. Thanks, thanks for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Can you hear me on this thing? I don't know. Hello. Oh, okay. Cool. I thought I was going to, like, pop it out. Anyway, um, 
So yeah, my name's Lee Hammerback, and I'm doing a presentation on it's sort of like uh, future proofing, but it's going to be kind of an overall about how to use like a database as a from a Vim manager's uh, perspective to kind of organize all of your content. Okay, I have a habit of pop popping my peas. <laughs> okay, <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> all right, uh, so uh, I have a bachelor's degree from. Uh, uh, NC State. I'm a registered engineer. I've uh, been doing Revit for like 12 years-ish, I guess. And in that period of time, I've kind of become like a self, self-taught self programmer. Um, I've kind of been the guy to do like Excel macros or Dynamo or whatever the case may be to like automate whatever process that comes along. And I, I think over time I've gotten gotten pretty good at it. And I'm, the longer I do it, the more I start to see how important it is to use like a database structure for a lot of like the backbone processes in, in our company. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about. And just real quick, shout out to my wife and two kids. I think my wife's watching right now. So, <laughs> and my mom. So hi, mom. There you go. Um, let's see. Uh, this is our, our family pet, Spikey. And uh, we were talking about future proofing. I was like, a, it's like a robot with a dinosaur on it. It's kind of cool. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and then this quote about from Dwight D. Eisenhower about plans are useless, but planning is essential. So a lot of the stuff about a, uh, this database thing that I'm talking about is just going, is setting up this like backbone infrastructure kind of thing for all of your data. Um, and then you're going to populate it later. So you're, you're planning ahead of time for what might come in the future. And, and in the end of the presentation, I'll give you a couple of examples where it really saved my butt. Um, it's going to seem like kind of this uh, ether magic stuff, and it's not going to make a whole lot of sense probably halfway through, but hopefully in the end we'll kind of bring it home and it'll make more sense. So um, let's see. We'll keep going. Okay. All right, so he was. Th we were talking about how uh, it's a really fast-moving industry, and there's all these different softwares out there that just keep popping up and and you don't really want to miss one, but who has time to like invest into these softwares and how is it going to interact with your current company's workflow? Um, we, we had we, we recently talked to uh, Clarity came by and did like this big presentation and and wowed us with all their cool little tricks. And I'm sure there's there's tons of them on this list that that have all the like Navis works, but. Um, but to take real real advantage of them, you really need to have your information well organized and thought out beforehand uh, is what what I've kind of learned. Um, I was talking to someone earlier today about um, Navisworks and how he had all these clashes that were um, like bogus clashes. And is there any way to filter out all these bogus clashes? Well, um, that kind of reminded me of, of uh, back in the day where we, we still get a lot of those bogus clashes at our company. But because we've like streamlined and really focused on what parameters are where, and we can really track our families really closely, we're able to like pre-write scripts and filters to like remove a lot of these filters, um, uh, remove a lot of these uh, clashes, false clashes before they happen. And that was just one little example of uh, how how future proofing kind of helped us out. Sorry, went off script a little there. Anyway, okay, so here's um, here's sort of like database flows. These little arrows are are what all of these different softwares have in common and they're basically representing like a query and a result so revit with dynamo or unify or whatever you're always like asking revit for something and you're trying to get a result back or avail whatever there's all kinds of like tools out there and you're always trying to do a query and get it back but what what the important part here that they all have in common is this uh, query and result interface back and forth. And that's usually um, directed by, you know, your BIM managers, your engineers, or your designers. Um, and that's kind of what where my database kind of structure um, lives, is, is trying to format all this information in a way that we can ask the right questions that we don't know what we're going to ask in the future. But um, if your stuff isn't organized, you're never going to be able to ask the right question. So all the tools in the world aren't going to like save you if you can't ask the right question. Um, yeah, there we go again. 
And the other important part is, is it trustworthy? If you're trying to design buildings and you can't trust the information that you're getting back, like how do you know this is the tonnage of the unit that the contractor sees on the schedule, for example? Or is this really the width of the unit? Um, so let's see. So, oh, so just a quick little illustration of the point. Uh, a contractor likely is going to ask, what is the tag, make, model, and quantity of your project um, for each of the scheduled items in the project? And I just grabbed an old job that we had and tried to look up all the parameters that all the schedules were using just for the tag. And you can see there's like equipment name tag, equipment tag number, tag one, tag two, mark code, like all these different tags. You never know which... Uh, unless you were like looking inside of Revit at that schedule, like each schedule individually, one at a time, you would never know what the real parameter actually is. So for a contractor who's receiving your BIM model, you know, they're never going to like be able to find that very quickly. They're going to kind of need an interpreter basically to like figure out what your data is saying. Um, so again, you know, Revit is a database. We should be, as a as a BIM manager, we should be thinking kind of like a data scientist. And, and everybody's heard garbage in, garbage out. That's huge in the BIM world. We were doing like these Kobe reports for one of our clients, and they wanted just like everything, and we end up sending them just these massive data, like thousands and thousands of of parameters. They're like, just send us everything, which I'm sure they just just throw it in the trash can as soon as they get it, because it's it's meaningless. It's just like just like before where we had tag one, tag two, cooling capacity one, cooling capacity two, like none of it means anything unless you can give them like the Rosetta Stone key to like interpret all that information. Oh yeah, I was gonna do something about this one. Yeah, has, has anybody heard of like the Cambridge Analytica people where they like took Facebook, you heard about that? So a lot of people treat data as like this kind of meaningless thing until they see somebody like Cambridge Analytica is able to like wield that thing like Thor's hammer. Um, just it's important to know that like all these little things of data that seem meaningless at the time, um, later on you never know, it's gonna be like super powerful. So um, for me at Mason and Hanger, I track every single parameter that we possibly, like anything that I can get my hands on, we should track it from the fonts, from the size, like anything we can possibly track, you should be tracking it because you never know like when it's going to pop in. Just sort of like you know, Cambridge Analytica folks, they get all these little clicks and dips and the next thing you know they can like win an election or something. So there you go, <laughs> the power of the data. So here's uh, database benefits. I'm going to talk a little bit about some like data scientist lingo a little bit. It's going to seem a little like abstract for a second here, but hopefully we'll I'll give you a couple little examples of it. So a database is self-describing. Um, that's sort of saying uh, that you're doing a lot of the work in the back end before, like you're, you're creating these relationships and stuff in, inside of this database so that you can read it later. You don't have to spend time, like if you're trying to update your database, you update it in one spot and it sort of trickles down. You don't have to rebuild these like relationships. Kind of like in Revit where if you add a, uh, a line pattern to in, in your Revit model, it's available um, as a line style, I think. Yeah, something like that. You can build your lines that way. So you don't have to reestablish that relationship every single time. Um, the data independence. Um, this is uh, changes to your data structure are handled by the database management system. And I, uh, one example I was thinking of, um, so like traffic lights. Um, a couple years ago, you started noticing traffic lights were getting like cameras put on them. And I'm sure you guys know there's like a, I don't know, a headquarters somewhere where they're monitoring the traffic flow. But that update for that we can call the, the traffic lights are sort of like the database and then the cars are the application. And so they were able to upgrade the performance of the traffic flow by adding those traffic lights. But you didn't have to necessarily change your application or your car to take advantage of that improvement. Is that sort of, I don't know. It made sense in my head anyway a little while ago. That's data independence. Um, let's see, redundancy. This is a big one if you're trying to manage uh, the database 
or you're trying to manage your Revit content, it's really crucial to have stuff only in like one place. Um, a lot of times they'll see, like we used to have all these different templates for all the different disciplines, and they would have loaded in them all of the families from that they needed to like start the job. Well, what would happen is we would find a, an error in one of those families, and now we have to somehow track down where all, not only like fix the error in like the main library, but now we gotta go to every single Revit template and fix all of those, reload them all in, what jobs that might be in, and et cetera, et cetera. It's just a real pain in the butt if something lives in more than one place. So at all costs, one place, sort of like the mantra of Revit really, is everything should be in one place. And then this one, enforcement of integrity constraints, w I thought was a big one because it, um, it just keep like if you're gonna put a, a text value in a parameter, if, if a parameter is a string, you have to put a string in there. If it's a number, you have to put a number. That's sort of what this is. Like if you're gonna fill out an address form, you have to hit that verify address is real. Um, you can kind of set that up in your database beforehand so you know you're actually getting like a real address. Okay, enough of that. So we, we talked a little bit about the benefits of the database structure. Now I'm going to talk about what is inside of a database, what kind of like the beating heart of it. And one of the big biggest, there's a relationships, which is what is tethering different tables together. There's a data normalization and naming. So we'll kind of briefly go through these. I'm still, people still following me here, hopefully. Um, this is a a little, this is from a SQL database and showing the different um, tables that we can have. This one in particular is about the Revit, it's our setup uh, database, so it has viewports, families, view schedules, leaders, all kinds of stuff, and the different arrows are the relationships between them. Um, you might be wondering why there's like so many dang arrows. It's crazy, right? It gets but but those are what make the database easy to update. If I if I just fix fo so if I add like a new font, it just gets passed on down to all these different tables like right away. I don't have to reestablish all of these connections. Which brings me to data normalization. This is really what we talk um, wh why there were so many different tables. This is if you don't if you get one thing out of this little kind of discussion that I'm having, this is like the heart of everything. You, do, you don't really have to use a database to take advantage of this concept. Excel can do it. Um, any, any sort of table-based thing can do it. Uh, you can use it for naming conventions or whatever, but um, the, uh, the kind of the concept is f figuring out what is a row and what's a, what's a field and what is a uh, what is the row versus record versus a table. So here's, if you Google it, you'll get this 1F 1NF, 2NF, 3NF. It's kind of, it doesn't really mean too much right there, does it? Nope. Um, <laughs> but in a second, I'll, I try to think of a really simple example to help you guys out understand what all this means. So I, I, I'm kind of a stickler in Excel for like proper Excel tables. And if I saw a table like this, it makes me like physically ill when I see a table like this. For one, this, these are like multiple different like parameters in one column. That should never. That shouldn't happen. We got titles. We got font size and font type, all in one cell. That's kind of worthless, really. Um, it's uh, it's very like you're you're trapped into this sort of format right now. And so it's this is kind of like I think this would be like zero nf. I'm really not a data scientist, but I would, I'd call it a zero nf. And and before when we saw all those um, all these crazy tables, this is kind of how it happened. My first pass at this was a giant Excel spreadsheet that was terrible and really hard to read. And we have this guy Dave Eccles works at our company, and he looked at it, and he probably had the same reaction I had to this Excel table to as to mine. But um, we blew it up into this configuration, and so basically the different NFs is you want. Every single thing is basically referenced by these numbers. So I, I converted this into basically this bottom piece down here with all these multiple tables. So like uh, doing it this way is what like makes your, your it's like data validation and it enforces that you're going to have the right information in the tables that you need. 
So like no one can add, uh, s you can't just make up some other kind of unit or a font style type or a font size and put it in a different table where it's not supposed to be. Changing the names of things becomes easier because uh, we're using indexes and not names. So if you update a name, it'll just automatically update that name everywhere that you see it because you're using the index for things. Just be really sure you don't update indexes ever because that would be a disaster. But uh, so you I don't does, any does everybody kind of you follow it? I try to make a so it starts out kind of easy, but like it blows, it gets crazy becomes like a dream within a dream if you keep if you do like a whole compound like this it really gets like gets to a cross side but you don't have to go super far here's a couple other little examples a discipline table or a viewport table so we do a lot of metric and imperial projects which is like kind of the bane of my existence in a lot of ways because oh you wouldn't like mm -mm, it's terrible so that's kind of what a lot of this kind of started up. We had like an imperial, these are view titles. So like if we have an imperial project, um, and this is like the client that that maybe is used on, the version that it is. And I'm just showing you little snippets of these tables. They go on and on. And, and you, can, you can add more to it as you go. If I write scripts that read these tables, it, they continue to work if I come up with a new, uh, new thing. Like if I want to add another column onto this table and my scripts are all reading this table it and if I write them correctly um, they're not gonna break I don't have to go and rewrite 20 dynamo scripts every time I come up with some kind of new new way of using this and that's that data independence thing um, I was saying like the scripts and stuff. Yeah, so he, the question was, uh, do you only add, if you're adding stuff to it, you should only add to the end? Um, it depends how you write the scripts, I suppose. Um, if, you're l if your scripts are writing, s or, or li looking for these headers in particular, and then they go down, that's one way to work. But that's where how the dream within a dream happens. So you could make a table of the headers with indexes. So if you really wanted to get crazy, <laughs> you can do that. So... Yeah, I haven't done that yet, but there was a few times where I wish I did, but I just go ahead and rewrite those little a couple of scripts that break when that happens. But you could, you could like make another table with the table. But so here we go. Oh, if you, if you don't want to do all this database thing, it's one of the low hanging fruits is a, your, a naming convention. Um, you can do a lot with naming because almost every software out there, any one of those ones I showed in the beginning, they all can read the names of objects. So be really careful with, with naming convention. I know it's like a never-ending struggle and people always, you know, there's a funny little thing here, but I look at ours, I can't even keep them straight between day to day. But if you keep trying, as long as you've tried and, and thought about it, I'll give you a couple tips here in a second. But if you put a lot of effort into these names and don't just try not to do some of these things I'll mention here. Um, I'll just go right to it here. Uh, so you can use that data normalization kind of thought process with the name. So if, if you have a, t if you're thinking about it with all these tables and they're all linked together, it might be, not all the time, it might be to your advantage to use those indexes in the name, kind of like client. Like you saw how I had imperial blah, blah, blah in the name. I was kind of using the same kind of methodology there with those names. Um, don't put the manufacturer in the name ever. Ugh, that is worthless. That means nothing. Really, you un unless you're talk unless you like are comparing manufacturers. I mean, I guess there is a time when you could do that, but not not in my experience has that ever been a good idea. There's a parameter that's built into Revit that every part has called manufacturer. It's like hard coded in there. There's no need to put that in the name ever. Same thing with like the category most of the time. Um, I suggest there's some, some programs don't like special characters. So if you're gonna use a naming convention, be really cognizant of that. Um, I like this camel case idea. That's where you uppercase, instead of using a space, you uppercase that word. Um, you can, and then to separate out like 
subcategories or whatever, you can use an underscore. It's pretty safe. Problem with the hyphen is sometimes it's a subtraction to be like sub it almost looks like you're subtracting one named parameter from another sometimes. Yeah. Oh. Ooh. That would be a bummer. <laughs> yeah, so there are, that's, the yeah, again, camel case might be your best bet because it has nothing special about it and you can use, but then it kind of lose a little bit of power when you do that. I don't know. Try different things. You're going to always come up with new, new different things. But one awesome point I made earlier about the 3NF is if you do make a mistake, which is likely to happen in your naming, if you've gone as deep as possible with all these, what time is it? Am I good? Yeah, I think I'm good. Okay. If you've gone like as far down this rabbit hole as, you know, as you're comfortable with, it's possible that renaming something won't hose you up. So here is an example of uh, that table from before, and we had the client name was the Department of State. And we decided we are going to change Department of State to DOS. So I'll go into that that table where we had client name, change it to DOS, because I already have all those relationships set up, any table that's looking for that one index is now just gonna be DOS. So if I have any scripts that are gonna be reading this stuff, I can pop redo anything. And this is just one little example. I, I do these like simple examples and, uh, and sometimes people get like stuck in the simple example. But this is like, nothing compared to what you could do with this concept, so keep that in mind. All right, I'm going pretty good on time. I cut out all these slides, but all right, so here is uh, that first question I asked earlier about the tag. So in my office, at least for the mechanical and plumbing, we use this equipment tag number parameter on everything. And this is a little snippet of my big, huge Excel monstrosity that I wish I would have had a in a database to begin with, but I'm working on, on fixing that problem now. But you can see it has the, the one big problem with mechanical stuff, by the way, is we have like one category or two, air terminal and uh, mechanical equipment is everything. So it's really hard to like split up. You could have 50 schedules that are all mechanical equipment. Um, so this little Excel thing has, it tells you like what um, schedule it's on. I can use Dynamo to find out what sheet that schedule is on. And we, we had a, a client that wanted to know exactly what the GUID was for each schedule, what the header was, because you can also, the field header can be different than the parameter name, you probably know that. So, so now the guy can look at the actual PDF to and know what GUID is responsible for that. Like if he sees unit number, that's really equipment tag number. And if he really wanted to be fancy, he could use that GUID and be absolutely confident that he got the correct equipment tag number, not somebody else's equipment tag number, because anybody can make a parameter called equipment tag number and pollute my model. Like if I bring in a manufacturer's thing, they could just happen to use the same name, but it's a different GUID, and and things can get kind of wonky. So that GUID is like a, what's it? I forget what it is. Something ID, obviously. Yeah, some kind of. It's like a serial key for for that parameter. Okay. Here's another little real life example. The contractor wanted to know what, uh, if we had any equipment with the smallest dimension larger than 36 inches to see if it would fit through a door. Um, if somebody asked you that, you'd probably, in one of our models, one of our projects is like, I don't know how many thousand, like, what it, how many buildings was it, Mark? The biggest number of buildings. 13 buildings, yeah, so we had 13 buildings, how many, yeah, 116 models, and if a guy asks you that question, how long is it going to take you to figure that out? A while, but I, not me. <laughs> this is what I get all, this is what I live for, this guy asking me that question. <laughs> so I can just do a query, because I know all, all my parameters, I've done all this database stuff with all my parameters, and I know every single family I can run checks to make sure if people are using my families. That's another lecture. But um, if people <laughs> are using my stuff, I can just I can sift through the whole thing, look for these three parameters, find the smallest one. Oh, this is these are metric millimeter numbers, by the way. If you're confused about that one, um, 
And they, these are all the ones. I, I just spat it out in Excel. You could use any number. I like Excel. It's sort of like the interpreter. It's good for reading stuff, but and everybody understands it. So, uh, boom. These are the these are the units that had widths or something that was above 36. The smallest one was above 36 inches. I know there's more to fitting something through a building, but just yeah, go with it. So here's another one. So Larry's Automotive wants to use Comic Sans on all their projects from now on. So Lee, can you go ahead and fix all the templates and update all the text types, fix all the schedules, view titles, keynotes, tags, yada, yada, yada. Well, sure. All I got to do is replace the one with the three and hit go, and I'm done. I just fixed, like, thousands of families, whatever. They're all good to go. If all my I don't need to update my scripts as long as they're not looking for the word um, Arial. If they're only looking for the lookup value here, three, you can do this. This is sort of an example of a SQL query. Uh, yeah, so that was pretty good. Let's see, the scripts can keep going. You can use Dynamo. That was one cool thing I saw about Clarity. Their little presentation is you can like batch run Dynamo. So if I had a Dynamo script that relied on this data that was reading my database, for example, um, I could just run it and away we go. The other uh, little fun little thing is that a lot of your information lives on your local server or whatever. So if someone gets a hold of your Dynamo script and you're real picky about giving away your hard earned you know scripts, it's worthless to them because they don't have your database and they need to l have login credentials to use your database. So that's another little. Some people ask about, you know, not wanting to swap their Dynamo stuff around, but, and I think that's it. Yeah, we crushed 30 minutes. Okay, it was a little faster than I thought. <laughs> Is there any questions, anybody? Or I can I can click through and show you some some big Excel craziness. Yeah, sure. If you want to, yeah. yeah. So if you make a shared parameter, it creates a GUID. So yeah, yeah when you, you go, go to the, the shared, shared parameter manager, um, it will it'll do that for you. It'll just kind of spit that out. N you don't know. It's pretty random. I guess there's just so many digits. You got to be careful though, because it is possible if you come back later and try to use the same GUID for a different thing. I don't know what'll happen, but I think it's like crossing the the uh, plasma streams or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, so like, I don't know if people have probably seen like voltage happens a lot. People will be like 20 different voltage parameters, exact same name, but you'll see voltage, 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 voltage. Well, those all have different GUIDs. And, and your schedules that should have been predefined already are looking at your specific voltage with the GUID. So if, if you're writing any codes or scripts, it's, it's a good idea to use the GUID to find that stuff. That's kind of like using the index. You're using the GUID rather than relying on the name. Because if you are going on solely the name, you don't really know which one you're going to get. Like Dynamo will just grab the first parameter with that name. If you had six voltages in there and you're trying to pull out the voltage for some reason, you might get in trouble. Um, I didn't repeat the question. Oh, well. Sorry, Perzil. <laughs> recommend yeah try not to do that but it's really like if a facility management software wanted to read your stuff you could give them this GUID that's what this whole thing was for so like uh, the Department of State if we give them this key they can basically get anything they want out of our model that that I have 
this is the little thing that's got you know the the subcategory which is what I created for because everything's mechanical equipment so this is sort of like my own little category and then the type and blah 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 I don't any more questions I'm yeah Basically, it's like utility. And they're all we try to use really generic parts wherever possible. So they all kind of look the same for the most part. Inline fan is a box with a duct on the end. Some of them get a little trickier than others, but usually you can overcome that with, with you know, you keep them all looking like boxes. Then you have a type catalog that you can populate to your heart's content, and you could put manufacturer stuff in there if you want. Uh, but the family name is still fan dash utility fan so if i want to know i want to see all the fans in my model i can just sort by family name and boom all the fans are there and then it's like oh what else is on the utility model so i can just spit out every single family in the whole project because when i'm when i'm naming them another thing i didn't mention was like i'm trying to visualize the whole whatever they're going to be with in a big list and how and sorting alphabetically is going to be like the easiest a super easy way to like find things. So fans should all be together. So I can do fans dash or underscore or whatever fans. And then the type catalog, um, you know, we have l wait a uh, couple different stretches, and you can just add all day long. And and generally, I I let the uh, engineers are creating these things per project. At least we started that way because the the worry was like some some product wouldn't exist anymore. And, you're and engineers, they might get kind of lazy and just assume that our database is up to date and then like it's not and the thing doesn't exist or it's too big or something like that. So I try to just let them create those type catalogs as they go. At least that's what we started with. And then certain items that are a little more dependable, like a toilet or something, like that's always going to be that size or a VAV box, you can, you I feel a little more confident with putting a little more specific things in that type catalog, so how's that? Um, also, you were saying earlier that because every element has to be in factor, right? Right, yeah. yeah, so, oh, yeah, so, okay, so like if you have a VAV box, they're almost all manufacturers have like ranges, so like a size, a four inch inlet VAV box can only do you know, 100 CFM to 200 or something like that. It's That's pretty much universal across the board. Every single one is that. So we start out with that, and then you can just populate it with, with, the, with whatever manufacturer you want. So those ones are pretty easy because they're just always the same size. When it gets, it's usually the bigger, fancier custom equipment. I generally, ha I have these like template families that are like Lego building blocks. So it has all the stuff that you need already in there, and then they can just like face host. They can kind of build the part how they want it for like a big air handler, like a custom air handler. That's how I use those, and sometimes it, it works. Someone would have to catch it first if it's someone would have to catch that. Oh, so the question was uh, control dampers using a low voltage and then switching over to um, line voltage, so 24 volt, right, to 120 volt or whatever it is. And now electrical needs to provide power to all these dampers. Um, how would we catch that? Um, so I do have a parameter in all of our parts that says requires electrical connector. So, oh little background all of our models are split up so electrical is not in the same model as mechanical for one um, but we all of our parts that do require power that are in our library have the thing checked so if they want to query our model for everything that requires power it would sh it would flag it and it would show you all of those items um, 
I, I do a lot more than that with it, but it would take a while to explain. S but as far as like, yeah, I guess if it came in at CA time, that's that's tricky, I guess, because I don't think people are like checking that all the time when the thing's already under construction. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> Yeah, if you were in this, if you were in the same Revit model, I think it would flag. You could flag that pretty quickly. Um, actually, it would probably break the um, the electrical connect, the electric circuit. I think that's how it works. Like if it if it wants to be a different voltage, it won't it won't work. So you could do that, and then the next time the electrical guys open the model, it'll like give them an error or say disconnected. Maybe. Any anything else? Any you mentioned you, your your production staff usually kicks off and makes the tight catalogs and stuff. Would you not could you not use this as kind of a starter type catalog? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the question was, uh, do we have a starter type catalog? And yes, I do. All of our type catalog, I, I use Excel for that. So I have like a little. Um, this just came up recently. Actually, there's a I made a little macro that will. So it's already got all the parameters in in the thing. And then I made a little macro that you click the little button and it'll save it as a TXT file right off the bat. So in the setup project, I have a like mechanical engineer setup thing. And they hit the button go at the start of a job. It takes all of our, this might not be the most like greatest use of, of a hard drive space, but it copies a lot of the common stuff into the project folder. And then they're instructed to go into the, that folder for all the stuff in the, this project, and that way they can, they can, to their heart's content, update that type catalog and not mess up our main library. And if they find some kind of mistake in one of the families, now I can go and fix it in our main library without screwing up like every job that's linked in. So that was something that was happening a lot for initially. Was all they would they would reload and be like, oh, everything blew up because I I fixed the part, but it wasn't so good for their their job. So any other? Questions? All right. Okay. Well, I hope I hope that was informative. I don't know. I'll do another one if it was. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>